And um, so we have Econom. Um, and then can you say your last name for me? I feel like it's uh, Obong. 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 Okay. Okay. And um, so this is the political commentary um, talk show that is all about social issues. It's about, um, you know, local politics. And it also is uh, for us social justice warriors who are out there and we want to try to, you know, make, make things right in society and um, just, just kind of keep fighting for the good causes and to have a political discourse on issues um, that are facing Michigan and America as a whole. Um, but, you know, in particular, I feel like I've, I think this is very poignant to have this sort of discourse um, in a time of the coronavirus because there have been a lot of gaps in our system, like systemic issues that have been exposed um, due to the recent pandemic. And um, so now we kind of see that there's a need for a lot of things that were fringe and seen as, you know, out there before on the left, like universal basic income and, you know, healthcare and um, just, just making sure that people are provided for. So, um, Ikana, um, you know, she comes to us uh, working with the um, the constituent services, and you're the district director for uh, State Senator uh, Erica Giggs. Yes, basically outreach. Okay, so outreach, and um, you're you're just taking care of the people. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'd always wanted to talk to you about like the, the work that you do, um, in the communities and, um, Econom is definitely like a, a very like outspoken person when it comes to the African <laughs> diaspora. She is a, uh, you know, a uh, second generation Nigerian uh, heritage uh, American, so Nigerian American, and um, she's very proud of the African roots that she has and wants to advocate for uh, diaspora communities to feel that sense of kinship the same way that, say, birthright individuals who um, have that that trip back to the motherland, so to speak, um, also enjoy. So, um, you know, she, she's just like an outspoken person who um, is, is full of energy and full of the fight and full of the, you know, just, I mean, you should see her, her Facebook. It's always, <laughs> it's always about, you know, it's just like, this is what we need to do. So um, I really, really am happy to have you on. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like the first question I really wanted to just kind of delve into um, knowing what where your passions lie and knowing what you do um, working with the state senator, um, I really want to just talk to like-minded people and find out how do we solve some of these problems, these systemic issues that, you know, have been exposed. Now we have issues where uh, paid sick leave is something that we're now thinking about, whereas other developed countries in, in you know, in the West, you know, you have all these Scandinavian countries in France, Europe, uh, France, uh, the UK, um, Spain, and you know, all these people, they were taken care of when they were hit with the coronavirus because they have, you know, procedures and policies in place mm -hmm. where, where it's not so much of, okay, this is, this is the end because now, you know, you're facing all of these problems. Um, and we don't, we don't have that social safety net. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like in some ways in America, the problem can be that, um, if you need to, to rely on it, I feel like this is the stigma. If you need to rely on the government, there's something wrong with you. You didn't work hard enough or you are somehow, um, you, you're not, you're not on that same level, if you need any type of assistance from the government, you are somehow less than, and it's your fault because you made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how can we begin to tackle the systemic problem? What are some of your thoughts around this? Just from experience and still learning, I think the, you start at the ground level, right? So who are these, these systems impacting, right? Um, every American, uh, every class is impacted by a government policy, positive or negative, right? So you start to, you know, organize those people who are, um, who are not making income to take care of themselves without 
extra government assistance. And I say extra because they've already paid into the government system, right? So it's kind of like if you need help, the purpose of us paying into the system is so we can get those benefits in a time of need. It shouldn't be a stigma that if someone fell on hard times that they would go to a system that they paid into to help them in a time of need. But the problem is hard times is every day. So then we have to look and say, okay, what are we doing wrong? Why are Americans so poor? And we are a developed nation, right? So you got to go back to the drawing board and say something is not connecting. So then we talk to the people who are impacted by this. We talk to community groups, right? And then we talk to the lawmakers who we elect to serve on our behalf and say, hey, something's not working out. We need new laws on the books to help us um, not be consistently falling on hard times. Um, and, that, and, and those are just the beginning thoughts, right? Before you get into the more complex things of, if, if I'm from a, a city and we have lawmakers who represent suburban or rural or other types of environments that may not see the exact same issues that urban populations see. So then, you know, you get into the, the that dynamic where it's like, it doesn't okay. affect me, so therefore, like, why do you need it at all? Right. So that's kind of, in America, we, we've kind of, we, we didn't used to be like that. Even though the 60s and the 70s and even the 50s were, you know, just, just full of social issues and full of inequalities for women, for people of color, I just feel like people as a society, they would think collectively, how is this going to benefit all of us, our museums right. and libraries and schools and new hospitals being built, is that going to, you know, lift us all up as a society? So then, yes, I'll invest in it, even though I don't have kids, I'll invest in a new school. Or even though I don't have any illnesses, I'll invest in a new hospital. But I feel like at some point in the late 70s and 80s and up into the 90s, we just lost sight of that. And it was more, oh, you can't fend for yourself? You're flawed. I'm not helping you. That doesn't even relate to me. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, right? Bootstrapping, yes, yes. But then it gets into like we have to ask ourselves, well, what type of country are we, right? Because I'm only as good as my neighbor. If I'm receiving all these great resources and my neighbors aren't, that still somehow impacts me. When we're thinking about global competing on a global level, when we're talking about advanced society. We hurt ourselves when we deny our neighbors, our other communities, American communities, uh, resources to make it to the next level, to, to thrive. Because we're competing with other nations that are taking care of their citizens, and their citizens have been making headway in different fields in terms of investment advancement and we're always asking ourselves how is america one of the most developed or is a, a most developed nation in the world or we're a world power but third world let me third world countries are leading in this industry or leading in that industry or leading in this industry it hurts us we can't compete so you can look at it as from a either if you look at it from a human perspective of everyone should have access or if you're looking at it from an uh, economical aspect, no matter how you look at it, we lose. It's true. It's true. If we don't have a collective mentality, and I think this right. is why, like, the international community, we all, you know, really want to advocate for, you know, just thinking collectively. If you think about environmental justice, if you think about, you know, mm -hmm. how, you know, policies like the Kyoto Protocol, if we all sign, you know, an agreement that says we're going to try to reduce carbon emissions or we're going to try to, you know, lessen the impact of our carbon footprint, then that benefits everybody. But for some reason, I think in America, we've kind of regressed to this. Um, I am not you know, necessarily concerned about what the rest of the world is doing. And it's, it's like American exceptionalism was a term that was coined because we were always kind of like trying to strive for greater, you know, mm -hmm. greater 
greater things to, to accomplish, like trying to land on the moon and trying to, you know, be Lyndon Johnson's great society. And that was everybody was, you eliminate poverty, you eliminate, you know, hunger, you, you make sure everybody's educated, you bring up the standards. And at a certain point, we stop doing that. And then, like you were saying, developing countries started looking at those ideals that we used to aspire to. And, you know, they started saying, oh, okay, well, you know what, we're going to try to be, you know, the number one in tech, we're going to try mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, we have clean drinking water, and we're going to try to, you know, so they started wanting to aspire to these things. And I feel like we were kind of left in the dust because of greed and sort of the way that our capitalist system sort of mutated into something where we yeah. are not necessarily, um, we're not empathetic anymore and I feel like I, I want to engage in conversations on how can we get back to that so um, you know I know that you you do a lot of work with um, you know just kind of people feeling better about themselves like um, your so so background on econom and she and I are um, both uh, fellows in um, new leaders council um, new leaders council is a progressive organization that's all about um, you know kind of cultivating the next generation of leaders in, you know, just, to, just American policy and not just policy, but um, entrepreneurship, being an activist, um, being involved in communities, um, no matter where you stand. But, um, you know, so economy, you really push for, you know, people to feel good about themselves. And it's like, yeah. I want to embrace my blackness, but at the same time, I don't want to alienate you. You know, you are proud of your people and your heritage, and we should be proud of our heritages um, as a collective society. But at the same time, you really want to kind of give people this sort of empowerment in that process. It's like, do you and at the same time, just, just continue to, to contribute to your society where you yeah. stand. So can you like expand a little bit about on, on that and like how empowerment really can, can serve communities, particularly like with your work in um, constituent services um, with uh, District 6? Is it, it's District 6, right? Senate District 6, yeah. Senate District 6, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, um, uh, that's Taylor. Um, Let's see, we also have, uh, well, there's 10 communities. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think I got them. I think I got them all. It's, um, Taylor eCourse? No, not eCourse. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I had them all <laughs> written down here in my notes. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Uh, Okay, you you just gonna have to give them to me because I'm like okay. <laughs> I'm blanking, I'm blanking out because I I'm trying to get to know my um you know congressional districts better like okay. in the state. Um, so what in conferences because I live in District One. Okay, you live in Senate District One. I believe so. Uh, yeah, I think or, I think no, you live in two. It's two. It's two. It's two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um. So Senate. Michigan Senate District 6 is uh, Belleville, mm -hmm. Brownstown, and I try to go to alphabetical order because sometimes I forget what I said and I didn't say. So Belleville, Brownstown, um, Flat Rock, Huron Township, Rockwood, Romulus, Taylor, Sumter, Van Buren Township in Westland. Nice. Hey. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So that, that's a lot. That's a lot. And um, it is a lot. our viewers here, like, hello. If anybody has any questions, um, feel free to to ask. Um, if you have any political questions or anything about um, what we can do to, you know, just just overcome some of these issues, because people keep saying, oh, when we get back to normal, but like, we're going to have to reshape what normal looks yeah. like. But when we get back to something, it will be something that was, this happened for a reason. I mm -hmm. keep saying that this was meant to happen because we're meant to pause and rethink what it is that, you know, that we, we do, but I, I, I don't want to cut you off. Um, I was in the middle of your question. So like, um, so yeah. Um, how do you, how do you kind of foster that sense of, um, you know, I can do something and I believe in myself. So therefore I can, you know, give that sense of empowerment to a community, a cause, keep momentum going, keep people's, you know, level of like activism strong. 
So in my mind, Stella, I don't know if you're familiar with Stella, now physician, Nigerian physician, um, physician, oh, musician. He was supposed to be a physician. His mama sent him to school to go to med school, but he took a different turn. But um, so he has this song about water not having an enemy mm. because you need water to survive. And water can kill you, right? So, like, you lose somebody, you cry, that's water. When you're making soup to feel better, you use water. You can drown in water, you know. So, water doesn't have an enemy, right? Mm -hmm. And the people are water. So, what in that song, what he was trying to explain is that we are the water. We can exist without government. But government cannot exist without us. We can all govern ourselves. So I use that as a foundation in my head when I'm, you know, engaging with people to help them empower themselves to understand that the power is with you. You know, we don't need government. We could do all of this ourselves, but government can't exist without us. So they have to represent us. They have to do what we say. We sent them to these different bodies to do for us and when they don't do it's just like a job right you fire them you find someone who can do the job mm -hmm. right and that's how i that is the foundation i use to empower people like hey you're not the first of all what is your voice right and then you're not the only one you'll be surprised to know how many of your neighbors actually feel the same way you feel we all have different perspectives or, you know, have different ways of uh, understanding or getting to the goal. But the main point is you have a grievance and so does this person, so does that person. And if you guys come together, you can magnify your voice. Yes, yes. That, this that is, is yours. That is perfectly said. Yes, this is I think good. one thing that um, Senator Geis does a great job of is telling her constituents, this office is yours. I work for you. Even the children who aren't even old enough to vote or uh, old enough to take care of themselves, she still tells the children, like, hey, if you see a problem, let me know because I work for you too. This is your office. This is your seat. You sent me to Lancer for a job. Tell me what it is that you need. We'll talk about it, we'll do it, and we'll get some, we'll work to get, you know, the right laws on the books, you know, considering how you have to, the, the process, process, process of getting that. Of but, you know, and, mm -hmm. so that's how I start the process of empowering people. Like, if you're breathing, you have a right to be here, you have a right to say something, right? And if your grievance does not step on the, the rights of others or is suffocating someone else or infringing on their happiness or their liberties, then it's all good. And we start there. So, you know, you, you work, you, you pay taxes. I'm like, look, do you pay taxes here? I said, I tell people, I'm like, listen, you better say something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because it's, it is. You better get to right to, You better oh, get to mm -hmm. DC. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i mean like it's your your right to speak up for those who don't necessarily know and mm -hmm. you know like you said with even telling the youth telling kids that you know okay this is one day going to be what you inherit so you really should advocate for your parents your grandparents and you know the adults in your life to be better custodians of the future they're handing you and to even take a, like have your voice heard so that you can even write to your state mm -hmm. i remember um I feel like my first taste of politics was when um, I was in, like, I want to say eighth grade. Um, the mayor of the little town of Woods uh, came to um, my, my class and just kind of spoke to the kids there. And I just felt like this was the first time to me a politician was accessible, who was mm. like, right there in your face and you could actually, and he was like, turns out he lived on like two streets over from me. And I'm like, wow, this is like, it's democracy is accessible. So like, I ended up writing him a letter and all this and saying, thank you for coming to our class. Thank you for teaching us. And I felt like because politics to me felt accessible, 
Um, it just kind of made me feel like even as a kid, I mm -hmm. could, you know, do something. And I think that's it, it even from there sprouted into like when I was 16, meeting like Jennifer Granholm and, you know, um, John Conyers and other, you know, prominent local politicians. It just kind of makes you feel like, OK, well, you know what, this is it's real and it means something. So, you know, you could take it in the, the next direction. And so you're cultivating that that youth that are going to inherit something that right now seems like oh it doesn't really impact me and it's good that you brought up the point about youth too uh, or you you came back to it because i remember we used to have mock elections in school like in elementary school they'll teach you like the basics like the three branches of government and checks mm -hmm. and balances right and then they'll like say, okay, what's currently happening right now? Is it a presidential election? Is it a mayoral race? And what, and the teachers would really, you know, do their best to present us unbiased information. Mm -hmm. So they'll just, you know, go through the news articles, go through the TVs or go through platforms and say, okay, this is what this candidate stands on. This is what this candidate stands on and just give it to us. And, you know, of course we're children, and we're learning so we know what we like and don't like but we don't know the complexities at that point so the complexities are influenced by what we hear our parents talking about and their friends when we go home you know so it was always a good time because we would always say well my mama said or my dad said but it was good because we were engaging and our teachers gave us the opportunity to cast the ballot even mm -hmm. though we couldn't do it in real life we can then say, well, mama, I want to go to the uh, the voting place with you. Or it's, it's, dad, I think you should look at the process is like. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you should look into this candidate. And then, you know, we have student council. And that is another way how we kind of play into participating in uh, political awareness, even at the primary and secondary uh, level in education. So I think that we need to kind of bring those things back to the classrooms, keep us engaged, keep students asking questions. It, you know, it's, it's really important. It helped me, you know, and it helped a lot of my peers as well, those real basic or, you know, introductions when we were younger. So, and then we would even write letters. Like, they'll tell us, like, you know, who do you want to talk to? Mm -hmm. My classmate wrote a letter to Bill Clinton, you know, but and we know that the letter that came back was a generic letter, but we didn't know that at the time. We it was wow, you have power. You you have power to actually do that, and somebody yeah. said something back. You know, I still look at that as like, wow, this is mm -hmm. this is democracy. You feel like yeah. actually your voice is really being heard, and I think um, with your point on like empowerment, it's really about you know just kind of making sure that people know that this isn't for nothing and if you get all apathetic then you know you kind of lose that sense of it's even in yourself if you're you want to learn a new mm -hmm. skill you want to get better you want to go on a like a fitness journey or saving money or being better with money or whatever it is it's like if you believe that like you know that 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 self-talk that you have um and i feel like there's this african proverb that i love uh les brown always says this it's uh when there's no enemy on the inside the enemy on the outside can do you no harm so like if you believe in your head on that with money uh, you'll always be and you'll always find a way to have less or to mismanage what you do have and to make the wrong financial decisions and so um it's it's really about realizing that you do have that 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 internal sense of i can do this and i believe in myself and you know you you can actually affect change yes so that's yeah. true okay and um so i think for one of our last questions um i really want to know like um what can what what can we get begin to do to start like grassroots movements that can help you know, people see gaps in some of these systems like, um, you know, the unemployment system being like kind of out of date. And so now that people are actually in need of it, you know, they, they, they're using something that's so archaic that, you know, it's, it's failing people, the websites aren't working, the hotlines aren't working um, because there's so many people that have been inundated due to this, you know, pandemic. Um, you know, what can we do 
you know, as we start to talk about reopening the country, um, what are just some of your thoughts? And I know we don't have like a panacea or a, you know, this is the answer. We're clairvoyant. <laughs> we have all the answers for you. We don't have all the answers, but what are some of your thoughts around one fixing um, just some of these systems that are broken and two um, reopening the economy? Um, that's a good question because a lot of what we see are seeing now, uh, lots of groups and coalitions and individuals were trying to address these issues a long time ago. So we see like, for example, like a shift in education about what America's focus should be in terms of what we should be studying now, right? One of the things, two of the things, you know, technology in general, and then like, for example, cybersecurity. So a lot of what we see now is a lot of people are tampering with Zoom or like infiltrating the Zoom channels and disrupting meetings and things like that. Um, the unemployment system is outdated. So people are shifting, telling, you know, younger people who are interested in technology, like, hey, like, we don't even need you to get a bachelor's degree because this is so crucial. We need you to get certified now and get to work and figuring out how can we transition from this platform to a stronger platform? How can we develop a platform that supports what is it, 10 million Michi uh, Michiganders? Is it Michigan? Yes, I should know this. Michigan. Michiganders or Michigan? I feel like, I think people from the outside say Michiganians, but but <laughs> I've, I've always heard, you know, uh, other statesmen, like other governors always say Michiganders and, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've never heard anybody who's actually from here say like Michiganians. <laughs> 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 so we need to develop these platforms that support 10 million plus uh, citizens who might need to get into the system all at once and not have any interruptions. Um, another thing, well, we did a good thing in 2018 by um, uh, voting the proposal, I think it was proposal two or three, I can't remember which one was redistricting and no reason absentee voting, but we voted for both of them, but no reason absentee. Now anybody can vote absentee, right? So now the next step is how can we do electronic voting, right? because now we're in a pandemic and we're in a pandemic in a, a middle of election year that's huge a presidential okay. election we have I u.s senate it in ways because it's just like it's, it's not at the top of people's thoughts anymore you know even though it was all during the summer so yeah, yeah. so now and you know the secretary of state jocelyn business have talked about this is electronic voting like not even absentee now because it's like now that we go out there to register for an absentee ballot or even mail, this pandemic is so scary, right? Because this virus could be anywhere. It could be touching the mail that we get and to send it back. And then we got to look at the security. How do we ensure that no one is sending in five ballots for, you know, one person? Or if we went to electronic voting, how do we make sure that uh, yes. those systems and um, things like that and I feel like voter fraud was always an issue even when it was you go you vote that's the end of story nobody's there's there's that's like a a low uh percentage of people who are actually conducting voter fraud but it's still a, a point of conversation that I feel like a lot of people on both sides of the aisle keep you know beating that drum and then now you you throw in you know things like absentees and, and digital voting into the equation now you're going to have this 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 being this question being brought up a million times i think yeah and even before you know we have we all talk with our peers and have conversations like oh this in person me live in a call or my job literally could be i could work remotely like i could be in another country and still do my job why am i still forced to come in and sit at a desk so those conversations happened before and now they're coming back to say the less people that are trying to get to work in the morning and go back home can reduce, like you mentioned earlier, carbon emissions. Um, when uh, Governor Whitmer uh, ran, you know, she wanted to fix the roads. Mm -hmm. So the less cars on roads ensure the uh, longer lifespan for roads. So exactly, especially how, you know, we're now coming back to these conversations and saying, 
we were on to something years ago, months ago, and this pandemic is just really exposing our unpreparedness. That's what what it's doing. We talked about the digital divide in communities like Detroit or Flint or Benton Harbor, or not even even rural communities. Yeah. You know? Not even just the urban, the rural communities. We always said that we have to do something because the world is going digital and we cannot be left behind. Exactly. And you need immediate solutions because when you think about it, there's a digital divide, not just in, you know, socioeconomic status, not just in, Mm -hmm. you know, racial groups, but it's more, you know, okay, in rural communities, yes, you're probably not going to be having as much access, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, because of just poverty rates. And then there's also, you know, the deaths of mom and pops and deindustrialization, which is happening all across the country. You know, you have a lot of instances where, you know, these industries where people have worked in these blue collar jobs and factories, now they no longer. So now you need that reliance on, you know, STEM technology. And, you know, I really think that community colleges have done a good job of getting people certified in certain um, fields where it's like, here you are, you have skills you can go off now and you can go and make an immediate impact versus, you know, there's, there's a really, really big emphasis on go to college, get a four year degree. People go off and get all these, you know, liberal arts degrees. And I mean, ah, we're products of liberal arts degrees, but at the same time, I think in some ways we undervalue, you know, just the need in, in skills mm-hmm. like, um, you know, plumbing, heating, cooling, and, you know, then technology jobs that don't really require um, a lot of, you know, just, just that, 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 that immediate skill or mm-hmm. you, you, you're going to, they do require that immediate skill. You can immediately start to get to work. You can immediately start to tinker and, you know, start to work while you're still a student versus, you know, degrees where, oh, well, you can't start until you're completely finished working. Right. <laughs> so you can start working as, you know, a digital design person or a, you know, um, someone who's learning coding. I know plenty of people who um, go to um, Grand Circus Park for yeah. coding boot camps and yeah. they don't necessarily have degrees in that, but like they, they go on to, you know, really make an impact with um, just kind of improving systems because we live in a digital age and now they have a skill set that wasn't necessarily in demand and there's like a dearth of people who actually are yeah. there to provide it lickety split like instantly so um i think you 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 hit it right on the head when you said like we we need a fix it now kind of you know mm-hmm. solution and we have to kind of retrain our, our 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 systems to think that way where we can have a little bit more you know immediacy yep so Okay. Well, you know what? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on and um, thank you for, for answering the questions. And it's always really like wonderful to talk to you and, you know, just pick your brain and discuss some of these issues. And I feel like, um, of course, we don't have all the answers, but this is a great yeah. way to, to start that conversation. And, you know, hopefully it will spark something that can, you know, um, begin to to give us Mm -hmm. solutions and point us in the right direction and um then we'll get more like-minded people and maybe even people who don't always um, who don't always agree and uh have have some some discourse that way so we can somehow bridge the gap of understanding and have everybody all on the same page but um any closing thoughts or anything you'd like for um, our politically savvy folks out there who, you know, want to know how you can get involved or what's the point and like, what are politics really going to solve and just open thoughts. Positivity. Am I, am I facing upright? Nope. You're upside down. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I think you're doing a great job, Ernestine, by, I, I see your updates with uh, Bill Institute and doing this, and I just want to encourage people to stay in contact with your elected officials, stay on top of them at every level of government. It is very important. If they have a coffee hour, if they send you a mailer or an e-blast, 
read those updates. A lot of those things include updates on legislative policies that they're working on. And a lot of people, um, a lot of um, elected officials actually look to us to be a part of those work groups. Like if they're doing a housing issue, they want to do a housing um, work group. Or if it's like small business development, a small business development work group that they can refer to when they're ironing out the details of different laws or different, um, go to those coffee hours or now virtually because we can't go nowhere. Um, call them, ask them questions. Their office, like I said, we that is our office. So call them, ask questions, um, get involved with your community, uh, black club level if you have to start. Uh, community associations, uh, try to participate in different, um, like a lot of parent groups or water, human rights groups, go to those meetings and just get engaged. I would say start there or figure out what you like, you know, what is the thing that really gets under your skin and start there because you don't have to be at every meeting, but you can go to where you're most passionate about and start there and begin to engage with different people across the board. So, um, you know, it's our civic duty to do so. That's true. That's very true. And I feel like um, you you hit on a really good point about like, I know that Tanisha Yancey, um, the state rep in my area, she has a coffee hour. She was having it way before COVID and then she switched to digital. Um, mm -hmm. I actually started having a coffee hour in Harper Woods and I invited Senator um, Adam Holier to join ours. And so they're, they're always available. I know it's really easy to access them. Um, and you know, they're, they're willing to join in discourse conversations and um, a lot of your local officials like mayors and uh, council people, they're, they're going to be available. Um, and, and it's, it's okay to hound them. Um, so you have permission to, to hound me and other, um, you know, staff. And I feel like, I think mm -hmm. it's really the staff of um, staff like uh, Econom here, you know, who are just like always on it and, you know, they're there for communities. And there's also groups like the Michigan Municipal League. Um, mm -hmm. They have lots of events and um, they've been having a ton of webinars that can help you kind of see what, what you can do for your own community. Um, and then also, um, of course, Econom talks about Build Institute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Anything, small business uh, incubator, and we're all about, you know, just being that, that force for entrepreneurs, especially, mm -hmm. um, you know, underestimated entrepreneurs a lot of um our graduates who go through our program come out with business plans and know-how and marketing strategy um, and they take an idea from start to finish and then they come out with something that is tangible and actionable so a lot of those folks are women and entrepreneurs of color um, and folks who normally you know wouldn't feel like taking a course for learning how to start a business is going to necessarily get them anywhere, um, mm -hmm. but they, they come away with it, with those classes um, with empowerment. So, um, so get involved. Um, I was actually just recently talking to a friend of mine I went to high school with, and he was just like, oh, I kind of want to be involved. And um, shout out to Steve. Um, he was like, <laughs> I want to be involved. Um, and he's a musician. So I was like, well, find out if your city has like an arts program that you can you know, get involved like an arts board or something like that, or get involved in, in that way where there's something creative that you can lend your voice to. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I just want to encourage everybody to start small and then keep going big and keep having that be that person who's going to argue and have that conversation with somebody yeah. across the aisle. Um, but in a respectful way, you know, always right. in conversations, never back down and say, you know what, whatever, who cares? My opinion doesn't matter or my voice isn't going to be heard because it will. And it's going to be impactful. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for being my very first guest. Um, this thank you for having me. Yes, yes. I mean, this started back in like November, December, and I had one person come on and it was going to be a podcast. We had a conversation about language learning. Um, and then I never had anything else, but I think, <laughs> you know, this is a perfect time to start trying to plan like the future. So like, what are we going to do to, you know, just, just be better humans. So, um, thank you for coming on. And this was, this is a lively debate. I'm so excited. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm happy the technical, uh, the presumed technical difficulties didn't come because I was worried about that. But this was yeah, good. Honestly. Looking, I'm, see, I'm trying to see because a lot of people actually joined. They came on and um, seeing if there are any questions. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, no questions here. But um, I just, I just want to say like this is this is the start of good conversations, and we want to keep it flowing. So, um, and I feel like there's nothing but good things in your future, and you're doing amazing things. And I just want to, you know always have your advice or expertise be a part of the, the discussion on how we can start a grassroots movement to change the world. So thank you. All right. Thank you all for joining us out there and uh, look out for us. I believe next week um, for, for more political discussions uh, with quick to politics. Thank you. Have a good night.